Welcome again to Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures can be found on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and YouTube. And if you want to keep them coming, I encourage you to go to my Patreon page, also under Historian Explaining, and you should see the link in the description and offer whatever support you might be able uh, to give. Over the past week or so since my last lecture, I've gotten several suggestions from listeners about further lecture topics that I might address. And I also, you might have heard in my last little recording, there are some other subjects I'd like to get to myself uh, as well. So there's a lot to talk about, and I'm going to have to figure out the sequence of uh, what to address when and how to try to keep a, a storyline going as I go forward. But there's one particular topic that people have asked about that I think I should address now because it's time sensitive, and that is this whole question of Catalonia. What is Catalonia? Why do so many of the people there want to break away and become an independent nation? And why is the government of Spain so determined to prevent that? Uh, these are uh, questions that have burst into the news about people, places, ideas that a lot of us have never heard of. So I'm going to lecture about that. I'm going to try to trace the history of Catalonia, uh, what is this region, how does it fit into the bigger picture of Spain, and why has this independence movement arisen and thrust itself so aggressively onto the political stage in within about the past 10 years. And it's a confluence of, of several forces. One is the fact that there is a deep-rooted, long-standing, distinct identity in Catalonia, and that has converged with economic issues and with a very common and widespread disillusionment with these central governments in Europe, which is common uh, in, in many countries, not just in Spain, uh, and disillusionment and frustration with the mainstream political parties uh, in Spain, which again, is, is, has parallels in practically every major country in the Western world right now. And as I'll mention again later, there are many interesting parallels and similarities between this independence movement in Catalonia and others like it, particularly in Scotland, which I hope I will talk about more uh, in later lectures, uh, Scotland. But the response of the Spanish government to this movement in Catalonia has been different from the UK government's response to the challenge in Scotland. Uh, so I'll get more to all of this, uh, all of this later, but uh, let's look back and, and consider the origins and the history of Catalonia, which is something that we can trace all the way back uh, to prehistory. This, you know, this region has a very distinct and long-standing narrative as, as a political and social unit of one sort or another. Uh, and it's not something on which I'm particularly an expert, so I've had to do a bit more research. I have studied some uh, medieval and modern Spain and the Spanish Empire, but Catalonia specifically is something that I was kind of taken by surprise about, as so many people were. So I've, I've had to do a bit more research, and I'm going to do my best to piece together this narrative in a coherent way that helps us to understand why uh, Catalonia is suddenly such a uh, volatile political flashpoint and may be on the verge of possibly breaking up one of the major countries of, of Western Europe. Okay, so Catalonia basically is a region, a uh, sort of small triangular shaped region at the far eastern end of what we call Spain. So it has the Pyrenees Mountains on the north and the Mediterranean on the south and east. It has pretty clear natural borders 
and it borders other regions of Spain to the west. So uh, it's it's not e- it's 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 not hard to sort of trace out Catalonia on the map. It's it's pretty uh, clear and distinct uh, what this what this region is. But it didn't always exist as a kind of distinct political unit. It was uh, the whole area of Iberia, right? The peninsula that we see as Spain and Portugal. That whole area was inhabited in prehistoric times by uh, by Celts, uh, particularly Celtiberians, uh, some other Indo-European groups, and some other non-Indo-European groups as well. And uh, particularly the Basque people are a non-Indo-European group that still persists to this day and that factors in to this volatile political situation in Spain a lot. There weren't very large, uh, powerful political uh, entities in what we call Catalonia until the area began to be colonized by Greek colonists. And several of the major towns around Catalonia were originally Greek outposts and settlements. These were then uh, conquered gradually by the Romans, and the entire area became part of the Roman province of Hispania. So a lot of the early infrastructure, roads, aqueducts, and such in Catalonia and all around Spain were originally uh, Roman. Now, as you might remember, Roman Hispania gradually uh, fell apart and was taken over by the invading Visigoths. Right? So Visigoths, or the Western Goths, were the particular Germanic group that invaded, uh, took control of Hispania, and set up a uh, Visigothic kingdom, which is basically the origins of what we now know as the country of Spain. Okay, And through this entire era, Greek, Roman, and Visigothic, uh, maritime, important maritime ports developed uh, along the Mediterranean coast of what's now Catalonia, particularly Barcelona and Tarragona. Right? So those are two major ports that we still see today that have their roots in this uh, early uh, Greek and Roman era. Now the Visigothic Kingdom of Spain was invaded and overthrown by a Moorish invasion in the early 700s. Right? So this sort of confederation of Arab and Berber and other Islamic states and tribes invades and sets up uh, a dynasty beginning in 711. Catalonia is in the far northeastern corner of Spain. So the Moors do not effectively conquer that area until 718, Right, a little, you know, a few years later, they then proceed northward over the Pyrenees and invade France, and this provokes uh, an organized and effective reaction from the Frankish rulers of of what we know as France. Right, the Frankish Empire under Charles Martel and his successors successfully strikes back. And under Charlemagne, the Franks actually counterattack back south over the Pyrenees, and they gradually take from the Moors that northeastern area we call Catalonia, uh, finally completing their conquest with the capture of Barcelona in 801. So what this means is that this northeastern area that we call Catalonia was under Moorish rule for a comparatively brief period only from 718 to 801, whereas in most of Spain it lasted for several hundred years, and of course in the far south, in Granada, it lasted all the way until 1492. So Catalonia is an area comparatively less affected by the Moorish dynasty. Its its art, its literature, its language is is, uh, less connected to North Africa and the Islamic world, and rather it is cut off from most of the rest of Spain for hundreds of years and trades and interacts much more with the other parts of Europe, right? The Frankish Empire, uh, Italy, Central Europe, and in these ways it's, it has a very different orientation 
from the parts of Spain that were longer under Islamic rule. The Franks called the whole area of northern Spain, running from Catalonia across through the Basque region to Asturias and Galicia, they called that whole area the Spanish Marches, right? These were the sort of mountainous northern areas of Spain that Christians under Frankish leadership were able to take back from the Moors and hold for, for hundreds of years, all the way from the 800s through to the 1400s. These Spanish marches were technically part of the Frankish Empire, right? They were part of Charlemagne's empire and that of his successor, Louis the Pious. Uh, they, and they served as a buffer zone, right? That's what marches mean, a buffer zone for the Franks against possible Moorish aggression. However, as you might remember from my lecture about the early Middle Ages, the Frankish Empire gradually broke down. It had to radically decentralize in the 800s uh, in order to counter the kind of chaotic danger of the Vikings. Right? So you get more and more local control of, of, of fortifications, local control of money, local control of warriors and troops, and the Frankish Empire, in effect, gradually falls apart. In Catalonia, the result was that the Counts of Barcelona, right, so, so the rulers of the town of Barcelona were considered counts, which comes from that Latin term comites, and it means sort of friend or supporter of the king. Uh, the counts of Barcelona become over time more and more effectively autonomous from the Franks. And uh, one particular count of Barcelona, Wilfred the Hairy, in the 800s, basically unifies the area around Barcelona, you know, creates a kind of confederation of the towns and cities in what we now call Catalonia. He stopped paying taxes to the Frankish emperors, right? So substantively, they become independent because they're, they're controlling their own money and revenue. And later in the 900s, when the Frankish rulers in France are finally replaced by a new dynasty, the Capet dynasty, the Counts of Barcelona stop giving formal fealty Right? So they, they never recognize uh, the Capet kings of France as their overlords. And effectively, uh, this county of Barcelona becomes, for all intents and purposes, an independent statelet, okay? kind of sandwiched in between France in the north and Islamic Spain in the south. In the 1000s, uh, there was a long class struggle between the broad base of the population in the county of Barcelona, which were what were called alors, which are basically uh, freeholding farmers, sort of small, free, small landholding farmers. And regional nobles uh, go on a kind of campaign to subject these freeholding farmers to their control and to demand money and fealty from them, right? So there's this kind of ongoing class conflict in the 1000s where the, the nobles basically try to make the county of Barcelona into what we would call a feudal kingdom, right? With a hierarchy of classes and with most of the population owing allegiance and owing rent to their sort of noble overlords. Uh, and, and this is a particularly intense struggle in uh, Catalonia, and it's never really entirely complete. And this is important to mention because this sort of pattern of class conflict and of struggles between uh, the sort of broader populace and the noble elite will keep uh, repeating all through Catalan history and ends up becoming important in the relationship between Catalonia and Spain and France. Okay. The main result of this class struggle was simply that the Counts of Barcelona really emerge as dominant. They are the only ones who have the sort of authority and wealth and power to effectively demand taxes and fealty 
from the farming commoners. And, uh, and the county becomes something more like a centralized kingdom, which uh, was very unusual in the early Middle Ages, but uh, became somewhat more common in the high Middle Ages. But Barcelona in particular is really, uh, it's a small state and it has a clear dominant leadership in this dynasty of counts that began from Wilfred the Hairy, who I mentioned before. And yes, that is hairy as in he had a lot of hair. In the high and late Middle Ages, uh, a new sort of identity emerges. The word Catalan was used the first in the early 1100s, right? And this, this idea starts to emerge that the various people in in this region who are under the rule of the Counts of Barcelona are a kind of people with a common heritage or way of life or identity. They're called Catalan. We don't know where that word came from. One of the theories is that it's a portmanteau of Goth and Alan because Goths and Alans were sort of the two main Germanic groups that had come into uh, northern Spain and kind of conquered that area. The, the th one theory is that those names were combined into this new name, Catalan, and the Counts of Barcelona came to be called sort of uh, rulers or leaders or princes of the Catalans. In the year 1150, so right on the heels of this development, one of the Counts of Barcelona, who by this time is also sometimes called Prince of Catalans or Prince of Catalonia, marries a princess from the neighboring large kingdom of Aragon, right? So in this whole era, era in the High Middle Ages, the small Christian kingdoms and principalities in the north of Spain are gradually expanding and conquering more territory from the Moors, right? Catalonia didn't really have very far to go because they were bound by the sea, and to the west of them was this larger growing kingdom of Aragon. So as a sort of political strategy, a political alliance, the, uh, the, the prince of Catalonia marries the queen of Aragon, and uh, they and their heirs create a unified crown of Aragon, right? So the rulers of Aragon, uh, the, the, from, starting from, from the children of this marriage, are kings of this kingdom of Aragon. They are also at the same time counts of Barcelona, and they also begin to conquer and annex more territories around them and add them to the, the domains of this single crown of Aragon, right? But the situation, uh, these various territories are not merged into one kingdom. Rather, Aragon and Catalonia continue to be governed separately as separate realms with their own institutions, their own laws, uh, their own money, and so forth, even though they are under this sort of united monarchy. In this new situation, uh, Barcelona gets access to new markets, right? They become the main port connecting this growing uh, Aragonese dominion in Spain with the Mediterranean. So Barcelona uh, grows and flourishes and becomes one of the major naval powers uh, and commercial powers in the Mediterranean and one of the main rivals of Venice, which really was, was by this time the premier maritime power in the Mediterranean. Catalonia, as I said, retains its own distinctive laws, customs, and institutions within the county of Barcelona. Uh, most particularly, Catalonia develops, early on, develops a very strong courts, right? And, and this is courts in, in Catalan, C-O-R-T-S, okay, uh, which means council or parliament, right? And it, cortes were common around Spain, right? Regions, kingdoms, counties would have their own uh, sometimes appointed, sometimes elected councils that would have some sort of power to limit the actions of the rulers. Uh, this courts in, in Catalonia was particularly strong and it claimed for itself the right to veto any new taxes or new laws that the rulers tried to enact. 
uh, and these this courts of Catalonia was one of the sort of earliest regular permanent parliaments uh, in Europe, right? The, the, the oldest, I believe, is the Al thing in Iceland, but this uh, courts in Catalonia certainly goes back at least to the 1200s. And in the year 1283, the courts promulgated a set of constitutions, which were basically uh, written proclamations delineating the special rights of subjects and uh, delineating the different rights and duties of the different estates of Catalan society. And each estate would have representatives in the courts. Uh, and you, uh, you might remember the, you know, the common uh, custom all over medieval Europe was to organize society in three estates, right? The clergy, the nobility, and the commoners. And each of these estates had permanent representatives in the courts. Uh, not only that, but the following uh, century, in 1359, the courts formed a permanent government, or sort of set of executive offices, with the power to carry out the laws in Catalonia. And this was called the Generalitat, right? Spelled like general, and then I-T-A-T. -A -T. So this Generalitat has been in almost continuous, or at least intermittent, operation uh, in Catalonia since the 1300s. Now you might notice here uh, these words that I just used to describe Catalan institutions are uh, a little unusual and slightly different from what we see in standard Spanish. Okay, uh, you know, courts instead of corte, uh, generalitat instead of, you, you might say in standard Spanish today, you might say generalidad with a D sound instead of a T sound. Well, these are markers of the fact that at this time, uh, the Latin language was slowly evolving into different Romance languages. And this evolution went in different directions in different places, right? So uh, Italian was emerging as a, as a new uh, distinct language in Italy. Uh, in many different forms. Uh, French had developed a little bit earlier, by about the 800s. You had a distinct uh, early French language. Uh, in Spain, you didn't get just one Spanish language. Rather, uh, different forms of Romance Spanish uh, developed in different areas. So the, er the, the Spanish that we know today, and I'll talk about this more later when we get into the, the politics of it, the Spanish that we know today is basically Castilian. And that particular language, the Castilian language, developed in the central interior heartland of Spain, which was under Islamic rule for much longer, and hence was divided and cut off from Catalonia. And in Catalonia, a different language evolved that we know as Catalan. Right? And by about 1200 or so, we can see a distinct Catalan language, which uh, has a different sound system, which is very different from Castilian. Uh, it, it is barely mutually comprehensible with Castilian Spanish. And in some ways, it has some more similarities with Southern French languages, like Occitan and Provençal. And, uh, you know, I've actually seen and heard it spoken myself when I was briefly in Barcelona for a few days. And you, you can see that e even if you are a good speaker of Spanish, you probably won't be able to understand much of Catalan. It's quite different. And to me, it looks and sounds very similar to Sardinian, right, which is a uh, whole different language spoken on the island of Sardinia in Italy which uh, was closely connected to Barcelona and Catalonia, right? So, uh, so this is truly a distinct language that shows kind of the distinct character of the place where it developed, which was very maritime, very oriented towards the Mediterranean and Mediterranean Europe, uh, and hence, you know, looks and sounds different. In the late Middle Ages, particularly, particularly in the 1300s, uh, the crown of Aragon continued to grow and flourish, and Catalonia continued to benefit uh, politically and economically from this rising power. Uh, Aragon and Catalonia 
together uh, undertook expeditions southward to conquer more territory from the Moors along the coast of Spain, and they conquered the region we now know as Valencia. And there are a lot of connections and similarities between Valencia and Catalonia. There are some speakers of Catalan uh, in Valencia. There's also, uh, as it happens, a separatist movement in Valencia, although it is much smaller than the one in Catalonia. Uh, they also colonized and conquered islands in the Mediterranean, including the Balearic Islands, uh, Mallorca and Minorca. And uh, they conquered large parts of Italy, particularly Naples and the regions of southern Italy around Naples, uh, much of Sicily, and uh, parts of Sardinia. Uh, and there was a small Catalan-speaking area in, in Sardinia, and for a short time, uh, Athens in Greece. So this became a, you know, a really major far-reaching maritime empire in the 1300s, and for a time, the, again, the main rival to the Phoenicians. Uh, as it happens, the the Catholic Church and the papacy disapproved of the crown of Aragon's conquests in Sicily. They considered Sicily to be a papal territory, and so uh, the Pope actually called a crusade <laughs> against Aragon and Catalonia in 1284 to five. But uh, you know, it didn't attract nearly the kind of enthusiasm of the Crusades to the Holy Land. Uh, you know, not that many people really cared about the political squabbles over Sicily, so it was pretty ineffectual. But for a time, they certainly uh, provoked the ire of, of the papacy. This flourishing of, of Catalonia within the domains of Aragon uh, ended gradually in the 1400s. There was a series of disasters. One was a very bad plague outbreak in Barcelona. And then following quickly after that, the rise of the Turks and the Turkish capture of Constantinople, which gave the new rising Turkish empire a major base from which to uh, take back or, or capture these various Aragonese outposts uh, in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, firstly, of course, in Greece. Uh, so the, not only the territory, but more so the trade routes, the safety of the sea lanes of this Aragonese empire fall uh, to the Turks. There also was continuing class struggle within Catalonia, right? So there's, there's continuing uh, political struggle over the, the powers of, of the crown, the powers of the nobility, and what sort of labor or goods or money they can extract from the peasants. Uh, this struggle breaks out into a peasant rebellion in 1462, which in a way kind of uh, puts the nail in the coffin of Catalonia as a major prosperous center on, on the Mediterranean. Finally, in 1469, the, the prince and uh, heir apparent to the crown of Aragon is Ferdinand. And Ferdinand basically can see that the crown of Aragon has kind of reached uh, a ceiling in how much they can really conquer within Spain. And that the crown of Aragon, in order to continue to pursue power, wealth, new territory, new trade contacts, will have to make an alliance with Castile, which is the now much larger and fast-growing kingdom that dominates uh, about half or so of Iberia. Right? And this is why Ferdinand uh, courts and successfully marries Queen Isabella of Castile in 1469. So we see a sort of repeat of the same situation that happened earlier in the 1150s, right, where ruler of, of Catalonia or of the crown of Aragon sort of looks westward and marries a female ruler of a more western kingdom in order to get access to more uh, power and wealth. So Ferdinand and Isabella become pretty effective 
uh, a pretty effective political team. You know, you might say one of the best political teams ever uh, in European history, and they uh, keep their domains separate. They still administer them separately with distinct legal systems and administrations, but they do combine some important powers, like creating a police force to pursue uh, criminals or bandits all over Iberia. And very importantly, they cooperate and combine forces in besieging and capturing Granada, which they finally uh, capture in 1492, right? So, uh, so in these ways, Aragon is able to maintain some degree of relevance and, and importance within Spain, largely through this kind of uh, acting as a kind of junior partner with Castile. Okay. Again, like the marriage of 1150, the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella produces heirs that then unify the crowns, right? They are rulers of the Kingdom of Aragon and Catalonia and Castile all at once, right? And this then becomes the, the foundation of what we now know as Spain, right? But it's important to remember that in this creation of uh, of, of Spain, uh, there were different distinct countries which had really different languages, different laws, different parliaments that remained in place for a long time, and one of them was kind of the stronger, larger, senior partner compared to the other one. And this situation is very similar. You know, I'll, I'll mention again, there are so many interesting parallels here to the situation of Scotland in Britain. Scotland, too, was not conquered by force by England, but rather uh, a single heir became the ruler of both England and Scotland at once. And the countries remained separate for a long time. They maintained separate identities, separate uh, governments, but under the same ruler. And one of them was clearly the larger, more powerful partner. Uh, in that case, uh, England. Okay, so this sort of partnership of Aragon and Castile, which forms what we now know as Spain, it worked out pretty well for Aragon, you know, especially at a time when the fortunes of Aragon and Catalonia are, are not looking so great in the 1400s. Now, Isabella, as you probably remember, is the monarch who decides to take a gamble on Columbus, right? And this ends up paying off tremendously, right? Castile ends up being uh, flooded with wealth and really buoyed with a new uh, prestige when they start making these fabulous, you know, uh, overwhelming discoveries and conquests in the Americas, right? Now, it's very important that it was Isabella specifically who decided to give patronage to Columbus, not Ferdinand, right? And she probably, you know, is the one who made that decision because she had a bit more resources to fall back on, you know, Castile being now the really dominant power in Iberia. It was not Aragon. What this means is that the technically the Spanish conquest of America for the first you know, more than a century, was not actually Spanish. Strictly speaking, it was Castilian. It was the crown of Castile that gave patronage to those uh, conquest missions and that claimed those territories in America. And moreover, they instituted laws that trade with America could only go through the Castilian port of Seville, right? Seville becomes the kind of umbilicus from Europe to America. So this actually makes it possible then for the Castilian merchants and Castilian uh, administrative elite, church elite, to benefit from these conquests of, in America, not Aragon and not Catalonia, right? And uh, trade and uh, exploration all over Europe gets dramatically reoriented towards the Atlantic, right? Whether that's America or, or Africa, too. Europe 
really turns to face the Atlantic and the Mediterranean by comparison falls into irrelevance and unimportance. So this becomes a time of, of considerable uh, languishing for the Mediterranean coast of Spain and especially Catalonia. Okay. Ferdinand and Isabella have a grandson, Charles, who comes from the Habsburg dynasty. So their daughter, Joanna, marries a Habsburg, and the Habsburg dynasty takes up the crown of Spain. And Spain becomes a, a, a Habsburg domain, same as Austria and Bohemia and those other Habsburg kingdoms in, over in Central Europe. Under Habsburg rule, uh, Catalonia continues to be administered as a separate domain under the Habsburg crown, right? It is somewhat integrated into Spain, but again, it is left out of this massive trade with America. Gradually over the 1500s, there was some economic recovery, right? The sort of uh, massive wealth and prosperity coming into Spain from this new empire does sort of trickle down, you might say to some degree, and, and Barcelona and other Catalan ports do become somewhat uh, prosperous again as kind of points of contact between Spain and the rest of Europe. Uh, but stagnation really returns again under Charles's successor, Philip II. Uh, you get uh, stagnation really un in much of Spain. Stagnation, breakdown, disorder, population loss over much of Spain from about the 1580s onward, and it really starts and is most severe in Catalonia. After 1600, uh, Spain is involved in many wars, right? Uh, it gets involved in various ways, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, in the Thirty Years' War, in a long war against a rebellion in the Netherlands, where you have uh, Dutch rebels trying to overthrow Habsburg rule. And the Spanish crown is really uh, hard-pressed to keep raising men and money to fight these, uh, these wars that they're entangled in. The crown begins trying to levy taxes on Catalonia contrary to the constitutions of Catalonia, which you remember uh, have been in place and that delineate the various sort of rights and immunities of, of Catalan people. So they start trying to abrogate these traditional constitutions of Catalonia. And in their wars against France, they Catalonia becomes very important, right? Because Catalonia, in effect, is kind of the, uh, the doorway between Spain and France. And the Spanish crown quarters thousands of troops in Catalonia and forces Catalan civilians to give housing and supplies to these, uh, to these quartered troops. This ends up provoking another rebellion in Catalonia in 1640, right, which has been called the, the Reaper's War, right, Reapers being your kind of basic peasant population, right, those who grow grain. So this Reaper's War is launched in 1640. The elite in Catalonia, rather than joining with the crown to put down this rebellion, instead they call together the courts and uh, declare a Catalan Republic, uh, which lasts for about a week <laughs> in, in 1640, uh, before this uh, sort of makeshift republic realizes that in order to uh, effectively overthrow the Spanish crown, they have to turn to the French, right, for support. So they ask for French protection, and the French crown basically declares their suzerainty over Catalonia. And you have this kind of uh, autonomous Catalan state under French suzerainty until uh, 1652. Now, you might notice... Uh, this Reaper's War, which led to the creation of this kind of autonomous Catalan state, it's reminiscent in many ways of the American Revolution, which also began when 
the uh, British government tried to levy taxes without the approval of the local uh, colonial assemblies and when they quartered troops forcibly in New England uh, without, again, without the permission and without negotiating with the local uh, assemblies. So it's, it's similar sort of issues coming up over and over again in so many of these rebellions. And it's also reminiscent of the English Civil War, which also was touched off largely because of the uh, English crown trying to levy ship taxes and other sort of loophole taxes without the approval of, of Parliament. And this Reaper's War in Catalonia began at basically the same time as the English Civil War in England. It was over very similar issues. And it was clearly part of this large wave of unrest, rebellion, civil war that was sweeping over much of Europe in the 1640s and which had its roots largely in the climate crisis, the fact that there was a climate cooling uh, in this sort of little ice age in the 1600s. So uh, so in many ways, Catalonia was simply participating in the same sort of patterns of political problems and social problems that come up over and over again all uh, throughout the West in the 16 and 1700s. But part of what is important about this Reaper's War in order to understand what's been happening in Catalonia is the fact that there was continuing class resentment and class conflict within Catalonia. But beginning at this time with, uh, with the Reaper's War, the, this class antagonism directs, is directed more and more towards the Spanish crown, right? It becomes more common for the sort of commoners in Catalonia to see the crown and to see uh, the domination of Spain as as a kind of class enemy, right? And to see Catalan separatism as uh, as a way of advancing their class interests as commoners, right? And we see an alignment beginning right here in 1640, an increasing alignment of the Catalan elite and Catalan middle class with ordinary peasants for in the name of Catalan independence. Okay, so this Reaper's War was defeated in 1652, but it was not an entire loss because the Spanish crown did agree to recognize the special regional rights of Catalonia. So it did put an end to this sort of campaign of encroachments upon the customary rights and prerogatives of Catalonia and its courts. Okay, so this situation basically holds through the rest of the Habsburg dynasty, which lasts until 1700, right? The last Habsburg king of Spain dies in 1700. He has no clear successor, and a succession crisis ensues. Now, if you were to go by simply traditional customs of, of inheritance in Spain, the last Habsburg king's successor should have been the Archduke of Austria, who was another member of another branch of the Habsburg family, right? So some people in Spain simply assume that, that the Archduke of Austria, uh, Charles, should be the next king. However, the close uh, advisors and ministers at the royal court persuade the Habsburg king instead to designate as his successor another relative, a sort of grand nephew, great nephew, who also happened to be a grandson of King Louis XIV of France, right? So these sort of courtiers around the king are hoping that he will bring in this French successor who will bring in kind of French-style reforms into Spain and will create a firm alliance of France and Spain. So there's this disagreement and ambiguity over who the successor is, and other countries get involved, right? Louis XIV in France really likes this idea of his grandson taking up the Spanish throne and maybe even annexing Spain into French 
domains. This is very appealing to him. It's not so appealing to everybody else in Europe who doesn't want to see a kind of superpower unified France-Spain, right? So Britain, uh, the Netherlands, Austria, other smaller states form a coalition in support of Charles of Austria and his claim to the Spanish throne, right? So we end up with this long, very destructive draining war, which we know as the War of the Spanish Succession, which goes basically from about 1701 to 1715. You know, it's very complicated because there are many different players and with many different goals, and they sort of come in and out of the war, but it's it's more or less a, about a 14-year-long war, okay? Now, how does Catalonia deal with this situation, right? Catalonia is still an autonomous county within Spain with its own leaders, its own parliament, its own laws. And initially, uh, Catalonia, the leaders of Catalonia make an agreement with Philip, the French prince, right? So initially, they are willing to entertain the idea of the, the French prince Philip coming in and uh, taking up the Spanish crown if Philip will promise to respect their autonomy and their constitutions, which he does. So they make this agreement. However, uh, you know, Philip is facing an enormous military challenge from this coalition supporting his rival claimant, Charles of Austria. And Charles of Austria actually lands in Barcelona, right? When he decides to, to launch an invasion of Spain, he's coming from the east, so the natural place for him to land is Barcelona. So he lands with a massive force in Barcelona, and Catalonia, in sort of self-preservation, switches sides, right? 1705, they switch and give their allegiance to Charles, basically on the same terms, on the understanding that Charles will preserve the autonomy and laws of Catalonia. Well, uh, what, what happens is, after about nine years of fighting, Philip wins the war, right? So Philip, who is backed by France, uh, wins the war. Now, he doesn't entirely win the war. Uh, it, it's a very complicated negotiated settlement where basically the other powers, right, uh, England, the Netherlands, and so forth, they agree to let Philip take the throne on the condition that he not try to unify the thrones of France and Spain, right? So they, they win the particular concessions that they want. They pull out their support for Charles. Charles of Austria is defeated. Philip is able to take the throne and rule Spain, right? 1714, Philip is basically now in control of almost all of Spain. He's basically winning the war. And he looks at Catalonia and says, okay, I have to capture Catalonia and subjugate them and punish them for their treason, right? From Philip's point of view, Catalonia has betrayed him by, uh, by abjuring the oath they had made to him and switching their allegiance to Charles. So Catalonia is sort of left, you know, really up a creek here. And Philip besieges Catalonia and Catalon uh, besieges Barcelona, I should say. And Barcelona, after more than a year of siege, surrenders on September 11th, 1714. Shortly after Philip captures Barcelona, he issues uh, a series of decrees, the Nueva Planta decrees, where he revokes the autonomy of all the various autonomous regions within Spain, right? So we're talking about Navarre, the Basque Country, Aragon, Valencia, Catalonia, all of them lose their autonomy and are put under direct royal rule. Okay, so a couple significant things to note about this. One is, is that, you know, Philip is, he, he comes from the French Bourbon dynasty, right? He becomes the first Bourbon ruler of Spain. And he and his Bourbon successors undertake this massive centralizing reform of Spain and then also of the Spanish Empire. Partly this is because of their French background, right? A lot of the administrators and jurists that they bring with them are French, and the model of government they have in mind is French absolutism, right? Louis XIV style absolute monarchy. Also, in addition to that, the 18th century in general 
is a period of consolidation and centralization all over much of Europe, right? This is this is not the Spain is not the only place where this where this happens, and a lot of these local regional domains that used to have various kinds of autonomy end up getting sort of absorbed into centralized absolutist states. Uh, and, you know, again, there's an interesting parallel. Uh, Scotland gets merged into the United Kingdom in 1707. It happens in a different way. It's more sort of consensual, but but the, but you see the same pattern. 1707, Scotland loses its existence as a distinct political entity, becomes part of the United Kingdom. Just a few years later, 1714, Catalonia is annexed into this new uh, royal state of Spain. And you remember the Barcelona fell on September 11, 1714, and that is effectively the end of Catalonia as a uh, sort of distinct domain. And Catalans actually celebrate or mark September 11th as their kind of national holiday, right? It's sort of commemorating that kind of last final stand of Barcelona against the Bourbon forces of Philip. Okay. After Catalonia is absorbed into this new royal state, their, their distinct laws and their courts are abolished, uh, and also the language is repressed. Catalan is banned as a language of government and administration, and later it is banned in schooling and education, right? So we see the beginning of this kind of French-style campaign to homogenize the kingdom and to sort of repress these, these regional differences. Okay. However, later in the 1700s, after 1760, I believe, this Bourbon government did pursue some reforms that benefited Catalonia. For one thing, they abolished the special monopoly, which said that only Seville could trade with America. So American trade is now opened up to, to other ports like Barcelona and Tarragona. And new industries start to, to develop in Catalonia, such as the cloth industry. Uh, and these sorts of uh, industries, you know, Catalonia benefits from them, again, because it can serve as this kind of intermediary connecting Spain to the rest of Europe, where there is a very large uh, market for products like cloth. In the 1790s and the 1800s, Catalonia ends up getting caught up in more conflicts. Uh, you know, there's this repeating pattern of, of dynastic and, and regional wars in and around Spain where Catalonia gets kind of caught in the middle. Um, it is right in the middle of the Peninsular Wars, right? These wars where France under Napoleon invades and tries to annex uh, Spain uh, and the Catalans uh, have to repeatedly pick sides in these Peninsular Wars and in dynastic wars over the throne within Spain, wars between liberals and conservatives. Uh, you know, there's a very complicated series of wars through the early 1800s in Spain, which I can't get into explaining, but repeatedly Catalans organize, pick sides opportunistically in these wars, and they generally pick the losing sides, right? <laughs> so they, they keep end up kind of um, shooting themselves in the foot in their kind of you know, bad bets on these various conflicts. Nonetheless, in the mid-1800s and later 1800s, Spain starts to industrialize more, and northern Spain, including Catalonia, are really at the forefront. Right? There are important minerals and mines in northern Spain. There are good ports. There are good uh, close connections to, to France and the rest of Europe. And Catalonia ends up uh, industrializing the fastest of any part of Spain, right? Uh, particularly the cloth industry grows, but other kinds of manufacturing as well. Uh, Barcelona becomes a significant uh, industrial city, and you get new classes and new political parties emerging with this industrialization. You get a growing middle class, which often is sympathetic to democratic republicanism and liberalism, and you get a left-wing, uh, often radical left-wing 
labor movement, right, with, with sort of radical uh, unions like the First International having uh, a strong base in Catalonia. At the same time that these new classes are emerging, you also get a movement of cultural revivalism. And this is also common in many parts of Europe in kind of the Victorian era. From the, you know, in the mid and late 1800s, there's a great wave of interest in kind of folk culture, folk traditions, and regional art and regional languages. So naturally, this gets picked up with a lot of enthusiasm in Catalonia. There's a movement to try to uh, revive the Catalan language, to create more literature and media in Catalan, uh, and to promote a kind of romantic nationalism. Okay. This then feeds into a, a growing uh, revolutionary movement which kind of explodes on the scene with the the creation of the first Spanish Republic, right? So there is a period of, of a republic in the 1860s and 70s, which is very volatile, many contending parties. You know, it's reminiscent in a lot of ways of the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. And Catalonia really was a hotbed of the kind of radical left within this short-lived republic in the 1860s and 70s. And you get a lot of anarchist unions and organizations and some early socialists and communists uh, as well. There is, you know, as often happens, there is a thermidor and a more sort of moderate conservative constitutional monarchical government takes back power in the 1870s. But this kind of radicalism in Catalonia uh, continues and it is wedded more and more to this kind of romantic regional nationalism, right? So once again, the, the class uh, radicalism and class antagonism in Catalonia serves to promote Catalan separatism and opposition to Madrid, okay? Uh, after about 1900, Catalonia also flourishes more and more as a center of art and avant-garde culture. Okay, Barcelona is one of the great centers of the Art Nouveau movement, and probably the most uh, celebrated, most impactful Art Nouveau architect of all time was Anton Gaudí. Uh, who designed many buildings in Barcelona that are still kind of, you know, strange, shocking, uh, kind of hyper-modern uh, creations. And the most famous, of course, is uh, the Cathedral of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, which is the sort of great monument of, of Art Nouveau, the great masterwork of Gaudí, and is... Uh, still under construction <laughs> because it's so big and complicated. Uh, so, you know, Gaudí and the Art Nouveau movement are an uh, early instance of kind of Catalan regional pride that also embraces modernism and innovation. And we really still see that, you know, resonating down to today, especially in Barcelona. There was rising regional organization and uh, movements for, for autonomy and democratization. Uh, the main organizers of, of the Catalan regional and national movement declared an autonomous commonwealth in 1913. So they sort of uh, forced the hand of the central government in Madrid and were able to get kind of tentative recognition as an autonomous commonwealth within Spain in 1913. Uh, so this was a significant step forward, but of course it was not enough for the more radical elements in Catalonia. Uh, there was a rise of anarchist unionism. Uh, the CNT became the main uh, powerful anarchist union. Uh, the CNT, through politics and strikes, is able to gain uh, an eight-hour workday. So Catalonia becomes uh, I believe, the first place in the world to have a, uh, an instituted universal eight-hour workday. Uh, and this kind of growing working-class radicalism actually uh, 
in the 1910s and 1920s, it actually drove much of the middle class and business class towards centralism, right? It sort of drove them away from Catalan separatism, which they increasingly saw as, as too radical and dangerous and made many, uh, many people in the middle and upper classes of Catalonia more sympathetic to Madrid and the central government. So we see more and more of a polarization where labor tends to be pro-independence, but the central government cracks down and revokes the autonomy of Catalonia in 1925. Right? So in the late 20s, we have this, this uh, again, a sort of reaction and uh, loss of Catalan autonomy. After 1929, uh, the Depression throws Spanish politics into severe crisis, as it does you know, much of the world. Uh, and in this sort of uh, you know, crisis and chaos and uncertainty of the early 30s, the Catalan separatists reorganized, they reformed a new Generalitat, and they supported the declaration of a republic in Spain in April 1931, right? So various kind of radical oppositional forces in Spain overthrow the existing, uh, you know, dictatorial government and create a republic, and one of the pillars supporting this new republic was Catalonia and this new Catalan Generalitat. The Republic grants a new statute of autonomy to Catalonia, which sort of uh, delineates the special powers over internal matters, things like uh, you know labor law, education, and so forth, uh, to the Catalan government. And shortly after, they also give a similar statute of autonomy to the Basques in northern Spain. So, so the the Republic allies itself with these regional autonomous movements. Okay, this Catalan government was under basically center-left Republican control, right? Left but not extreme left-wing control until 1934 when a uh, left-wing Marxist coalition of sort of unions and revolutionaries took over in Barcelona. This left-wing Marxist group uh, did continue to support the Republic, and it gave it actively supported the Spanish Republic against a military and fascist coup led partly by Francisco Franco that tried to overthrow the Republic in 1936, right? So beginning in 36, Spain falls into civil war, and you have uh, the, the loyalists who support the Republic fighting against... Uh, sort of juntas of the military and fascists trying to overthrow it and install a dictator. Catalonia is firmly on the side of the Republic. However, there is all kinds of struggle and conflict within, Catal within Catalonia over which particular groups will run and govern Catalonia while it is participating in this civil war. Okay, This becomes a very complicated multi-sided struggle. Uh, there's a lot of struggle between the more extreme and less extreme socialist parties and militias in Barcelona, Barcelona and in the rest of the region. Uh, particularly, certain unions and certain parties aligned with the Soviet Union, right? Catalonia began to accept arms and money support from the Soviets, right? And this was very important because, uh, you know, Britain, France, the United States stayed neutral and did not support anybody in the Spanish Civil War. Some volunteers from Britain and the United States and other countries went and fought on the side of the Republic in the Spanish Civil War, but, but, they, but they did so as private citizens, right? So if they wanted foreign help, they had to turn to the Soviet Union, and a split arose within Catalan politics between those who basically wanted to follow the directives and the leadership of the Soviets and those who wanted to keep power in the hands of sort of local street organized grassroots unions and councils, right? Uh, 
the general attitude and policy of the Soviets was that the Catalan government should not be too radical, right? Which sounds ironic, right? But the, the Soviets wanted a more kind of moderate policy respecting the business class and the powers that be within Catalonia in the hopes that then they could win the support of Britain and the United States and these other uh, liberal democratic powers. Whereas the kind of local grassroots organizations tended to want a more radical reformed society. And they, uh, when they controlled Barcelona, they instituted a, a kind of uh, a sort of anarchical syndicalist society, right? Uh, workers seized control of factories and dockyards and so forth. Uh, tenants seized control of buildings. And you had something that looked more like what we would call a, a communist, <laughs> an ideal communist society. Whereas the Soviets opposed this, even though they were formally communist, they opposed this uh, for strategic diplomatic reasons. And, uh, the, you know, again, Barcelona became severely split. There were episodes of street fighting uh, between pro-Soviet and anti-Soviet militias and unions. Uh, strategic points in the city were fought over. It was really a, a mess. And this is largely what George Orwell wrote about in his book called Homage to Catalonia. So uh, Orwell was left-wing. He was a socialist. And he volunteered to go to Spain and fight in international volunteer brigades in support of the Republic. But he was, you know, horrified and disgusted when certain unions and political parties that he supported were attacked by the Soviet Union and by Soviet-backed communists. And they were called, often were called Trotskyists, and they were falsely accused of secretly colluding with Franco and the fascists. Right? So this sort of version of the Spanish Republic that the Soviets promoted through their propaganda machine was this idea that, uh, that, that it, was, it was a war between sort of real communists and Trotskyist traitors who were undermining the Republic and colluding with, with Franco. So, uh, you know, Orwell was, was disgusted and horrified, particularly by how many professed left-wing people all over Europe believed this uh, propaganda line coming out of the Soviet Union. And he, he wrote about this in his book, Homage to Catalonia. He wrote largely in praise of this sort of uh, anarchical, communistic society that emerged in Barcelona during the war. And it was largely these experiences in Spain that uh, turned him deeply against what he saw as the Soviet totalitarian distortion of reality. Their kind of rewriting of history, rewriting of reality, and that's what you then see come up very much in 1984. You know, 10 years later, uh, he writes about, uh, sort of warning about this willingness by totalitarian governments and power of totalitarian governments to kind of change reality and change history to suit their uh, agenda. Okay, so we have this divide and this infighting within Catalonia during the war, and this probably contributes to the gradual weakening of the republic, right? And the, uh, the, the fascist coup begins in northern Spain, and it gradually pushes southward and then eastward and uh, conquers uh, Valencia and then finally uh, captures Barcelona in 1938. So we see a, a sort of echo in 1938 of the fall of uh, Barcelona more than 200 years earlier in 1714. Uh, and once again, Catalonia is subjected to direct rule from Madrid. Its autonomy is revoked. Its political institutions and laws are all uh, overturned. And you see a very severe political repression in Catalonia under the dictatorship of Franco, more so than we saw under the Bourbons. Okay? The, the Franco government lasts from 1938 until Franco's death in 1975. So it's almost 40 years of, of rule. It's very repressive. There are severe laws governing uh, you know, dress and censorship. 
there is you know enforcement of of the authority of the Catholic Church and and the Catalan language is banned right and uh, we're not just talking about it it was disallowed for use in government or schooling it became illegal to speak Catalan at all in public you could be fined and or, or face even worse penalties just for speaking Catalan publicly on the street so there is a, a long concerted effort to suppress the really the existence of Catalonia as a distinct social region within Spain and uh, this of course inflames intense resentment in Catalonia resentment not only towards the Franco government but really towards Spain as a whole right and this is where we see a lot of the roots of this attitude that we hear among many Catalan people that they are not Spanish at all okay this is not what this is not what most Catalan people say but there is a significant and growing no, uh, portion of people in Catalonia who say I don't consider myself Spanish at all I am Catalan this is that is my nation okay there's a feeling of isolation as well okay Spain it becomes very cut off again it comes it becomes very cut off from the rest of Europe okay uh, other Europeans don't feel safe or welcome traveling in Spain you know speech and art are severely repressed uh, and Catalonia resents its its feeling of isolation within the boundaries of Spain nonetheless uh, gradually over the course of the 50s 60s and especially the 70s a sort of new cultural vibrancy emerges in Catalonia okay it it's still nonetheless it becomes a center of modern art uh, there are famous uh, uh, painters like Joan Miró uh, in Catalonia. There is there is theater, there is literature, uh, music, and uh, the sort of Catalan, the feeling of Catalan distinctness and separatism gets closely linked to this sort of taste for modernity and artistic innovation, a lot like it was back in the Art Nouveau era uh, with Gaudí. So there's this funny sort of merging of, of, of forward-looking modernism with this kind of romantic uh, Victorian folk nationalism okay and all of these again go hand in hand with a sort of left-wing populism right very unusual and important convergence okay of these different forces merging together into this distinct Catalan identity Okay, and again, there are interesting parallels here to, to Scotland, although certainly the, the stakes and the passions seem to be higher in Catalonia. Okay, as I said, Franco dies in 1975, and in the later years of his dictatorship, Franco had sort of brought in the king, Juan Carlos, into a sort of ceremonial role of legitimating what was basically just a, you know, petty dictatorship uh, government. After Franco dies, the king sort of steps into a caretaker role and encourages a gradual transition to democracy, right? In 1978, a new constitution is adopted democratically. This constitution of 1978 allows for the central government to negotiate extensive autonomy for the various regions within Spain. Okay, in 1979, a new statute of autonomy is passed, restoring local self-government over several areas like education to Catalonia. Okay, in the wake of this democratization, this restoration of democracy and civic freedoms in Spain, firstly, the prestige of the monarchy is is enormously bolstered. There's tremendous respect and appreciation for King Juan Carlos and a new kind of uh, real substantive uh, political prestige for the monarchy, more than we see uh, probably anywhere else in Europe. There is, as I said again, there is a, a, ret a return to regional autonomy. The constitution, it reserves sovereignty to the monarch and the central government, but it empowers the central government to negotiate autonomy individually with each region okay so Spain is not federal like the United States is where you have constituent states that each have sovereign powers that join together to form a federal government uh, it's not like that in, in the US or the Netherlands 
Rather, there is a sort of haphazard system of granting different autonomous powers, negotiating with each region individually, right? And Catalonia just happens to be one of the regions that seeks after and demands a great, uh, a great degree of autonomy. Uh, and the Statute of Autonomy in 1979, you know, is certainly a big step, but it is not enough. It is not satisfactory to many Catalan separatists who want to see more local self-government and something more like a federal Spain. Okay. There is also a repeal of most of the censorship and political repression that Spain had seen under Franco. And this, what you might see is this kind of repressed energy in Catalan society uh, explodes out, right? This happens to some degree all over Spain. There's a sort of celebration of new freedom, uh, you know, experimental art, uh, sex, uh, a, a huge uh, new uh, gay rights movement. Uh, all of these things sort of uh, burst out in Spain after 1978, but particularly in Catalonia, right? And in, in Catalonia, you know, Barcelona becomes a major center of, of art and architecture. Uh, it becomes a sort of, uh, you know, party and nightlife capital, a, ce a major center of tourism, uh, and they kind of openly flout the sort of repressive puritanical uh, norms that they had uh, been living under to some degree under Franco. And I think, you know, you can see this sort of, this kind of celebration of, of vibrancy and experimentation in a lot of uh, Catalan art. Uh, and you can see it also, I think, in, in the films of, of Pedro Almodovar, which a lot of people outside Spain uh, have seen and which, you know, maybe some of you are, are familiar with. When you look at films, especially as films about women, like uh, All About My Mother and uh, Volver, you see this sort of contrast between Madrid and La Mancha on the one hand, which is where Almodovar is actually from, and Barcelona, where, you know, Madrid and, and La Mancha look very sort of austere, you know, monotone. Uh, there's an intense traditional life, church life, and then Barcelona is freewheeling and unpredictable and mysterious and colorful and uh, you, you, you see all this sort of strange, uh, you know, gender play and, uh, you know, complicated, weird alternative relationships centering in, in Barcelona, right? And you can see, I think, in Almodovar this sort of uh, attraction to Barcelona and to Catalonia as this, this the, sort of the most free and defiant part of Spain, okay? And again, we see this confluence of left-wing populism, regional nationalism or separatism, and modernism. Now, on the other hand, when we look at Spain, as I mentioned, Spain's response to separatism in Catalonia has been very different from other countries like Britain's approach to dealing with separatism in Scotland and Wales. Spain is a democratically governed country, right? Real political power, powers of government, are in the hands of an elected parliament and prime minister. However, there is, I think we can say, a persistence of hardline nationalism, authoritarianism, and centralism, in particularly in the conservative parties in Spain. Right. So when we look at, for example, the uh, Partido Popular, which is currently in power with Prime Minister Rajoy, uh, this, this is not like the Tory party in Britain or even like the Republican party in the United States. The, the center-right parties are not particularly interested in you know, local self-government or decentralization. Rather, they continue to support a strong central government that they believe must maintain social order and maintain the integrity of the Spanish nation. Right? So they're, and they are much more prone to crack down and to reject even the legitimacy of any sort of call for, for independence. Okay? And that's important to, to keep in mind. In 2006, a coalition of left parties were in power in Spain. And this government, this left government, negotiated a new statute of autonomy 
with the Catalan Generalitat. Okay, so they uh, grant considerable, you know, more extensive local control in Catalonia to the local government over schooling and education, which is important because the local government prefers to conduct education in Catalan rather than Spanish. More control over tax policy and the budget, right? So more tax revenue could be uh, allocated uh, by the, the local government and even the tax burden could be distributed and allocated in large part by the local government. So this was a significant step towards something more like a, a federal type system where internal matters would be under Catalan control and they would simply remain under a sort of Spanish umbrella for, for matters of state and, and the military, right? Um, shortly after this left party lost power and the Partido Popular and a, a, a right coalition took power and in 2010 the Supreme Judicial Court in Spain struck down the statute of autonomy, okay? And this is very important for, for a number of reasons. So in 2010, the sort of financial and real estate crash had hit Spain, and it hit Spain very hard, right? A very serious real estate bubble burst in Spain. And there was a lot of economic loss uh, in, in Spain and a lot of frustration and disillusionment with the central government, which many people you know, blamed for this disaster. So... Uh, so in Catalonia, you have this, uh, you know, disillusionment and frustration due to the financial crisis combined with a sort of fear and distaste towards the conservative government in Madrid, which was quite hostile to, uh, to Catalan separatism, and the judicial court striking down the statute of autonomy and revoking Catalonia's uh, power to control uh, taxation and and schooling, and this was uh, very disillusioning. Uh, it 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 convinced uh, m many Catalan separatists that they would never be able to achieve the sort of autonomy that they had been promised within Spain. Right? It it more or less it discredited the idea that. Uh, that separatism could be satisfied and that internal self-government could be achieved as part of Spain. Okay. Now, at this time, uh, the uh, most of the Catalan people did not support independence. Okay, and that seems probably to still be true. It's hard to tell because uh, people don't really have the freedom to conduct polls and surveys. Uh, in, in Catalonia, uh, the different options for autonomy are very complicated. It's hard to know how to divide the question, how to word the question. But it does seem as if uh, you know, only a minority, fewer than a third, of Catalans wanted independence as of 2009, right? loosely speaking. You had a large chunk who wanted uh, more autonomy and sort of federalism in Spain, and you had some who did not at all. Who, who basically favored remaining in Spain. And certainly today there's a significant portion of the Catalan population that's not from Catalonia, that come from other parts of Spain, uh, especially southern Spain. And they, they don't see any advantage in Catalan separatism or independence, right? Uh, so, so this is not, we cannot say that there is some sort of overwhelming movement or some large majority of Catalans who want independence. Uh, especially not as of 2009. However, the 2010 ruling did sort of throw gasoline on the fire. And as I said, it convinced many of the people who had preferred uh, autonomy within Spain to instead give up on that option and embrace the idea of independence. So after 2010, we see a big increase in the number of people saying they favor independence. Uh, it goes up you know, surveys vary, it's hard to say for sure, but it pretty clearly goes up to over 40%, over 40% saying they want independence. And it's continued to sort of slowly edge upward in that area between about 40 and 50%, right? Loosely, roughly speaking. And we see a polarization, right? As autonomy becomes more and more difficult, 
as Spain uh, continues under a conservative government, we see polarization and people in Catalonia forced to choose sides between accepting the status quo and going for independence. After the 2010 ruling, we see a series of large marches and rallies where extreme separatist slogans like Catalonia is not Spain become more and more common, right? And this sort of language of, of Catalonia as a totally separate nation that is not and should not be part of Spain becomes more widespread. In response, in 2012, the Prime Minister Rajoy shut down any sort of negotiation or talks with the Catalan government, right? So the the sort of uh, president of the Generalitat, Arturo Mas, had tried to initiate negotiations uh, with Rajoy to restore some of those autonomy powers that had been lost because of the court ruling in 2010. And Rajoy simply reacts completely negatively and, and rules out any sort of talks or negotiations. The court system also prohibited any consultation, meaning they they barred the Catalan government from carrying out a kind of poll or referendum or survey to gauge how many Catalans wanted independence, right? Uh, the, 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 the court basically holds that, that even, even a non-binding vote on the question of independence would be illegal and against the Constitution, okay? Now, this is a very uh, ambiguous uh, kind of point, you know, exactly what kind of vote uh, is permissible under the Constitution of 1978? Uh, is the idea of eventual ind independence uh, permissible? Uh, if not, can the Constitution be somehow changed to allow for eventual independence? All of this is very ambiguous, but in, since 2010, the judiciary has come down very consistently and strongly on the conservative anti-independence side. And uh, it's actually, there's a common problem and common pattern in Spain of the judiciary basically following the lead of the elected government, right? It's, it's very hard to develop any sort of independent judiciary in Spain, which is not surprising when you consider that under the Franco government, there was no independent judiciary. And so there, there were no precedents, no customs, and there was no kind of class. There was no sort of, uh, you know, class of of technocratic independent jurists, right? And when you don't have that, it's very hard to then develop that out of thin air. And instead, what you have is these appointed judges in the Spanish government tend to follow the lead of the parties in power, especially those if they were appointed by the parties in power. And uh, the Judiciary basically tends to ratify the position of the conservative government that no sort of move towards greater autonomy is acceptable, let alone independence. Okay. In 2014, the Generalitat held a consultation anyway, right? Uh, and again, this comes just on the heels a few weeks after the referendum in Scotland, right? And there clearly are many, um, you know, there's a lot of you know, mutual cues and examples being taken between the Catalans and the Scots. The consultation is held. Most Catalans don't vote in this consultation, right? They know that it, it, it has no legal force. And people who oppose independence see no reason to vote in it. They don't want to give it legitimacy. So only a minority vote in this consultation, and they vote overwhelmingly, over 80% for independence, okay? In 2015, the regional government in Catalonia holds another round of elections, and various left and center-left parties in Catalonia who supported the idea of independence uh, banded together into a coalition, a sort of joint ticket called uh, United for Yes. I believe it's uh, Junts, Junts Pel Si in Catalan. Uh, uh, joined together for yes. And their stated goal was to win over 50% of the vote. And their argument was that if this coalition for yes won over 50% of the vote in, in the Catalan elections, then they would have a mandate to 
hold another referendum, and declare independence. Now it happens that this coalition fell just short. They only got about 48% of the vote, so just a little less than half. However, they were able to create a government and uh, gain power in Catalonia because they made an alliance with another sort of new movement called CUP, uh, C-U-P. And uh, CUP was sort of the dark horse in this election two years ago. Uh, CUP was a, a sort of uh, local reform organization, a kind of left-wing but uh, pragmatic uh, organization of, of community organizers and activists who took over small councils, right? Town councils, municipal councils, uh, you know, minor government offices in order to improve things like, you know, roads, sanitation, education, these sort of, uh, you know, local grassroots concerns, right? And they generally had no interest in competing in sort of higher levels of electoral politics, whether that was in the, the Generalitat or the or Spanish Parliament. Uh, they didn't do that until 2015. They sort of held an assembly and said, okay, let's run candidates for the Catalan uh, regional government. And they ended up winning uh, a, a surprisingly strong share of the vote. I believe it was around 9%, right? Uh, and, and, and they're able to do so largely because they already have a base of support and a certain level of familiarity in local communities. So COOP is not specifically dedicated to independence, right? They're not a specifically nationalist organization, but they do support the idea of holding a referendum. So they actually joined together with the Hunts Pelsi, this sort of left coalition, uh, and put them into power in the Generalitat. And once in power, the, the, the United for Yes basically charges ahead with their agenda. And decides that they're going to hold a referendum and they're going to do it whether the Madrid government approves or not, whether the judiciary approves or not, and they're going to do it whether or not the opposition in Catalonia agrees to it. And they sort of use very aggressive parliamentary tactics to sort of, uh, you know, run roughshod over the opposition and declare that they are going to hold a referendum, you know, no matter what, and that if yes, wins in the referendum, they will then declare independence immediately, right? That the Generalitat will unilaterally declare independence. So they're, they take this very, uh, you know, extreme uh, course of action. In their view, the referendum is, is binding. In the view of the Spanish government, it is illegal, okay? And uh, in, they, they hold the referendum in October, on October 1st, as you probably saw, it's, it has no official sanction from the Spanish government, so it takes an incredible feat of organization and planning to manage to, you know, surreptitiously sneak ballot boxes to all of these thousands of polling stations all around Catalonia and collect these hundreds of thousands of votes. You know, it's really an incredible civil uh, undertaking. And as many of you probably saw, on October 1st, uh, Spanish national police were dispatched into Catalonia, especially into Barcelona, and they forcibly broke up several dozen of these polling places, right? Often broke in, uh, forcibly took ballot boxes, destroyed ballot boxes, forcibly pulled people uh, out of polling places, people who were in line to vote. Uh, several were thrown downstairs, you know, dragged by their hairs. There were hundreds had to go to the hospital. It was really a brutal scene. Now, the Spanish government will correctly tell you that those police were not sent into Barcelona on the orders of the prime minister. They were sent in under a court order, and that is true. But as I have said, the, the courts, we don't see a lot of independence here on the part of the courts. They tend to follow political cues. And the, the courts did declare the referendum illegal, not just in the sense that it had no legal force, but that it was an illegal act simply to hold it. Okay, And at, uh, dozens of polling places were forcibly broken into and broken up, but most were not. 
uh, and, and this is significant, and, and as some journalists have pointed out, there seems to be something of a pattern here where the police particularly targeted affluent middle-class areas of Barcelona, areas like Barceloneta, whereas poorer and more working-class areas, they more often left alone, and the voting went on there undisturbed. Why would this be? Well, the government knew that there was a history of sort of, uh, you know, radical militant organizations fighting against riot police in some of the poor areas of Barcelona, areas where you had a lot of people living on the street, a lot of squatters. They had experience dealing with riot police and certain levels of, of kind of street violence. Whereas in these middle class areas, people were really unaccustomed to that. And it seems as if the strategy was to really frighten and intimidate these people who, who were not used to facing that kind of forcible uh, repression. Now, not surprisingly, of course, this strategy also backfired. Uh, it seems that, again, they didn't, you know, police did not remember the invention of cell phones and apparently didn't anticipate that images of these violent altercations would be uh, broadcast all over the world and produce a real uh, political crisis for the Spanish government. Okay. After these scenes were seen around the world, of course, many people expected that the Spanish government, the prime minister, uh, maybe the monarch, would come out and say something conciliatory, say, you know, we regret that maybe excessive force was used, we want to respect people's right to freedom of speech or freedom of assembly, but no, that is not what happened. Uh, the prime minister and then the king, Felipe, made very clear statements that what, Catalon, what the Catalan government did was illegal, they said nothing conciliatory, uh, said nothing about any possibility of talks or negotiations, and uh, instead really backed what the police had done. And it seems that they did so partly out of conviction, but also on the part of the prime minister, also because that's largely what his party base favors, right? There's a, there, as I said before, there's a, a continuing strain of authoritarianism and of contempt for both for regional separatism and for sort of popular action uh, in the Spanish conservative parties. And it seems that, you know, Rajoy's words have been well received among his base of supporters. And following the vote, there were sort of dueling rallies and marches, both in Barcelona and in Madrid, where you had uh, pro-independence uh, militants calling for a declaration of independence. And you also had opposition to independence sort of organizing peaceably in Barcelona. And in Madrid, we see you know, large rallies over the past few weeks that in many ways resemble the sort of you know, right-wing rally that we saw in Charlottesville, Virginia, where uh, there were some fascist symbols, fascist slogans, uh, a lot of chants, uh, you know, denouncing the the Catalan government, calling them sort of gangsters, uh, you know, golpistas, which means kind of uh, gangsters, traitors, and really a, a sort of, it might be a minority, but a significant popular demand for uh, a crackdown on Catalonia, uh, you know, a, a widespread desire to sort of uh, suppress this separatist movement and, and kind of teach these Catalan separatists a lesson. Okay, there was a work stoppage in Catalonia following the referendum. It was called by the unions, uh, including, you know, regional left-wing unions within Catalonia and also some Spanish national unions called for a general work stoppage in Catalonia. And it got widespread participation, including many small and medium-sized businesses uh, took part that might not be, you know, as left-wing, but uh, favored, uh, wanted to show solidarity to the Catalan separatist movement. And there was a certain degree, again, uh, that the, this, this crackdown on October 1st it seems probably through fire, through gasoline on the fire, much like the judicial ruling in 2010 did. And it convinced more people that uh, a sort of federal Spain was impossible. And it created a certain amount of sympathy 
for the separatist movement among people who didn't actively support it. Uh, and you know, one thing that you saw on social media, for example, was there there was a, a sort of noted incident of a young man who went to one of these independence marches and he had a sign saying, I do not support independence, but I cannot see my countrymen being beaten up, right? And, and, and that's the sort of sentiment that now has come into play in some of these sort of moderate people in Catalonia who again are being driven to choose a side one way or another. And it's, it's yet to be seen whether they might be persuaded uh, one way or another by Madrid or by Barcelona. Okay. The Generalitat and the regional parliament met again for the first time today, for the first time since the referendum. Now, according to the platform of the governing parties in... Uh, in the Catalan parliament, they should immediately declare independence, right? They held the referendum as they said they were going to do, and around 90% of the votes were yes for independence. So they, it seems that, you know, according to their own words, they should now follow through and simply declare independence unilaterally. However, that is not what the regional president named uh, Carles Puigdemont that is not what he did. Uh, it, it seems that he judged that Catalonia could possibly gain some sort of support internationally if, instead of declaring independence unilaterally, they called again for negotiation. So what, what Puigdemont did is he called for a suspended declaration which is this funny sort of, uh, you know, splitting the baby thing where he said, uh, you know, we have the right to independence because of the referendum, but we won't declare it yet. We will seek negotiation with Madrid for a few weeks before we actually make a declaration. So this, you know, on the one hand, this might be sort of an astute political move that he's kind of throwing the initiative back to Madrid to decide what to do and putting the pressure on them to start a negotiated process. But on the other hand, as the leader of the opposition in Catalonia said, uh, uh, Inez Arimadas, she said, you know, this is, uh, you're trying to have it both ways, you know, a, a declaration in installments is still a declaration of independence and you don't have a legitimate mandate to do that. You haven't actually ascertained that that's what the Catalan people want, right? And she uh, again forwarded some of the uh, common arguments against independence that the opposition uh, uses. For example, she herself is from Andalusia in the south of Spain, as many people in Barcelona are. She comes from the south of Spain. Uh, she held up her passport and said, I have family and friends in Andalusia. Are they going to have to bring their passports just to come and visit me, right? And this is precisely the same argument that we've heard many times in, in Britain. You know, if, are we going to create a, a border with passport checks between England and Scotland? And are we going to separate all of these families and relationships that exist across that, that border, right? So this, th th that is basically the state of the debate as of now in, within Catalonia as of, as of today. Now, uh, what is at stake and what is the argument against independence? You know, th th that's a very complicated question. I won't get into uh, the argument against independence within Catalonia. You know, a lot of it might be obvious, the, you know, the economic cost uh, the, the economic uncertainty of having to set up a separate government, set up a border, and so forth. In Spain, uh, there are other things at stake as well. Okay, the, the, the sort of big elephant in the room through all of this conversation is the Basque country. Okay, so there's a region uh, in far northern Spain, northwest of Catalonia, again, right on the border of Spain and France, where the main ethno-linguistic group is, is Basque, which is, they, they are not Indo-European at all. They're completely unrelated 
to Spanish or French. They're, the Basque language is a totally separate uh, language, very ancient, that apparently was there before any Indo-Europeans showed up. And they have also had a very long-standing, fierce independence movement, uh, which sometimes has involved terrorism. Uh, you know, Eta Yuskadi Ta Askatasuna is the sort of long-time uh, militant Basque uh, militia that has used bombings uh, as part of their strategy up until about 2000, uh, 2008, I think, they disavowed uh, and stopped using violence. Uh, but if Catalonia even makes progress towards eventual independence, the Basques are sure to follow up and capitalize on that. Right. And and so that really doubles the stakes right there, because, you know, Catalonia is a major industrial region. The Basque country has major mineral resources. Right. The north coast of Spain, Bilbao, that is an iron mining, copper mining, uh, gemstone mining area. So the real threat here is not just a separate Catalonia. It's the possibility of a complete breakup of Spain, really, you know, the, the Basques are sure to follow up. Then what about Valencia, uh, the Balearic Islands? What about Asturias? Uh, and it goes back to this, this issue that runs all the way through Spanish history, which is, can you really speak of Spain as a kind of unified entity, right? It's always had this weird political fragmentation. It's always had linguistic uh, fragmentation, you, different, different language groups, you know, not everyone speaks Castilian, and through most of Spain's history, most people didn't speak Castilian. Certain radicals and separatists, including anarchists, communists, and regional separatists, during the Spanish Civil War, had this saying, uh, Spain is a fiction, right? And they meant this in the sense that, you know, you, you could mean it in the Marxist sense that nation states are always this kind of invention by the bourgeois class. And you can also mean it as the, the, there is no coherent social or cultural or, or linguistic entity that we can call Spain. And so the Catalan independence movement threatens to kind of uh, unmask that and threatens a, a breakdown of, of the Spanish nation state. Now, furthermore, for the other countries outside of Spain, you know, we can ask what approach are Britain or France or Italy or Germany taking towards this crisis? And what approach is the EU taking towards this crisis? Well, there's a great irony here. Uh, these countries in general don't want to see Catalan independence because many of them are facing regional separatist movements of their own that they don't want to encourage and they don't want to legitimize, right? If Catalonia gets its independence, then uh, what about Corsica in France? What about, what about Venice and Sardinia in Italy? What about Flanders in Belgium? Again, what about Scotland and Wales in Britain? Uh, the, all of these European nation states are faced with loss of territory and loss of resources if they allow these kinds of uh, you know, regional national movements to grow. Uh, and hence, uh, not surprisingly, the EU in general is not stepping in in any way in defense of the Catalan independence movement and are clearly hoping that it just goes away, right? In, and if they do end up intervening, it's only going to be because of shame and embarrassment at the, the, the images and stories that people see coming out of Barcelona. Okay, and the irony, what is the irony here? Well, the irony is that it's precisely these, this kind of international integration and the creation of international institutions like the UN, the EU, NATO, and so forth that, are, that allows for this growth in regional separatism. Okay, how is that? Well, if we were talking about, say, 1920, and a region like Catalonia or Wales wanted to be independent, this would raise all sorts of questions. How would they defend their borders militarily? Uh, how would they create trading relationships? Would their trade and travel uh, be cut off? Uh, they would be sort of cast out into this very scary, uh, you know, kind of dog-eat-dog -dog world of, of European power politics. 
uh, that's not true anymore, right? We have an increasingly integrated Europe, and an integrated Europe in which many small countries, you know, Luxembourg, Ireland, Denmark, can do quite well. Uh, they participate in NATO. Uh, they're under the sort of umbrella protection of NATO. They are part of the, the free movement and uh, single market of the EU. And in all sorts of ways, uh, the, the sort of drawbacks and frictions that come with being a small country are being smoothed over by this European and global integration. And that makes it much more conceivable to think of these countries becoming independent. Right. And again, the parallels with Scotland are very interesting. You know, when the Scottish National Party campaigned for independence in 2014, one of their arguments was that once independent, they would become a NATO member and an EU member. But this argument was upset when Spain said, we won't allow an independent Scotland to become an EU member. And why did Spain say that? Because they were afraid that if Scotland set the precedent, then that would embolden Catalan and Basque separatism as well, right? So there's this weird kind of blowback that many EU member states are facing where uh, the, the integration of Europe is, is paving the way for these uh, these local movements that they don't want. Okay, and again, we see a, a similar confluence happening again where class resentment, regional identity, and disillusionment with the central government and disillusionment with the major parties are all combining to fuel many of these independence movements in the wake of the financial crisis, right? And Cat Catalonia arguably is just at the forefront of this development, both because they have this long, deep-rooted regional identity, but also because they are facing the most sort of flagrant uh, repression from the central government, which inflames these separatist feelings and, and deepens the polarization, okay? So this is basically the knife edge things are on now. We're going to have to see what the Spanish government does, uh, and we're going to have to see what uh, Puigdemont and the Generalitat in Catalonia do. Uh, but remember that you know, as, as interesting and as significant as this Catalan story is, it also has these reverberating implications for all of Europe, and hence really for the entire world. Okay, thank you so much again for listening. If you can offer any support to help keep these uh, lectures coming, please go to my Patreon page, contribute uh, whatever you can. And if you have topics you want to hear about, uh, please uh, email me at historiansplaining at gmail.com. And uh, probably in the near future, I'll start making some lectures patron only, just to, uh, you know, provide more content and show my appreciation for, for those who are making contributions uh, to keep these, these lectures feasible. So thank you again for listening, and a special thanks particularly to my patrons. Thank you.